Okay. So, hello, my name is Aram and I'm going to talk to you about security design principles, which are very high level uh, concepts that everybody should know. This is actually part of uh, the OWASP SAM education and guidance practice level one. So everybody involved in software development lifecycle should know these principles. They're not so hard to follow. So everybody, not even people who don't have really uh, deep technical background should be able to understand them. And there are eight principles which I've selected. There are actually a couple of more, but they are a bit tricky and I actually didn't like them that much. And I, I think for me, this is the, the great basis to, to talk about. Um, well, we're gonna go through each and one of them one by one and we'll start from uh, the first principle which says secure the weakest link and well your security is as strong as its weakest link uh, it's a very obvious thing to say uh, but an, a, a great analogy is if a bank and a, and, a, and a supermarket would have the same amount of money in the vault bandits are unlikely to go for the bank they would more likely go and rob the store simply because the store is less secure and your overall security is, is as secure as the weakest part of your security. It's like a factory. The factory is as fast as the, as the slowest part of the factory. So, and um, some examples from actual stories. You might be using very strong cryptography and using best practices, AES-256 for symmetric encryption, for instance. But then you, what you do, you push your master key in the public Git repo. And yeah, as, as you can see, you, you are using great security, great cryptography, uh, but then you're doing something stupid. Um, and in this case, uh, the weak link is actually the person who has pushed it to the public repo. I've recently read uh, something very, very similar, actually. Uh, someone, um, a car manufacturer, so a software team or someone from the software team from a car manufacturer was in charge of designing the... Uh, the opening and the closing of the car and what he did uh, I'm not sure which car was it I, ha I have the feeling it was Hyundai but I'm not super sure uh, but what he did was he, he followed a tutorial online on how to do it which is not a bad idea I mean it, it's not like the tutorial was bad the, tu the contents of the tutorial were great what the guy did is he used the same key for the actual production thing he used the key from the tutorial to protect the car so yeah everything was broken then um, and I, I would say that typically human is considered to be the weakest link, but that's not always the case. And to find the weakest link, so it, it's not like there is, you have to use this uh, library or this component to, to protect against this, uh, to, to make sure that this principle is correctly implemented. Thread modeling would be a great approach to look for weakest links. So it's, it's not that easy to, to find the weakest links. But Doing thread modeling is, is a good idea. That's the first principle. By the way, if you have questions, you can stop me anytime because the principles are not really, really related. Uh, well, actually, the second principle I want to talk about is related to the first principle. And the second principle is using defense in depth. So using more of a layer uh, defenses rather than adding one big defense in, in the chain. Uh, so using the official term, uh, definition would be using several different independent methods to protect the same thing, uh, security in layers. Um, you could also use dif diverse defensive strategies. Uh, and yeah, well, that, that's largely the same, the same as the methods. Some examples, some actual examples, content security policies. This is a bit of more of a technical thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you know what content security policies are. For those who don't, I'll try to explain it in, in human language. Uh, so there are these sort of attacks, which we call cross-site scripting, which means that somehow I trick you uh, to execute in your browser a script which I have crafted. And there are different ways to, to make that work, but essentially it boils down to your browser executing a script which, is the, which does not originate or which is not intended to be part of the system that you are opening or to be part of the website that you are opening. And there are different approaches to prevent cross-site scripting. 
And the last line of defense is uh, content security policies. And what they do is you introduce headers in a, in a web page that instruct your browser that, hey, you should only execute scripts from my domain. The, obviously, the, there is no way attacker can upload his script to the original domain. Well, there are ways to go around that as well, but this is one of the defense strategies. So then your browser knows I'm only allowed to execute these scripts if they fulfill this criteria. It's, it's a whitelist approach and, and anything else from these, I'm not going to execute that. That's, that's what content security policies are. So if imagine you do all everything that you need to protect against XSS, this is another la layer to be added in case something you missed something or something goes wrong. Other examples, password hashing and salting. Uh, nobody wants his database breached, but in case a database is breached, you want to make sure that passwords are not leaked. Uh, so then, then you want you want to introduce password hashing and salting. So even if your database is breached, there is still a layer of defense that protects the passwords of everybody. Um, web application firewall, another example for la layer defense. So you're going to stop suspicious traffic, which is clearly uh, malicious traffic at the level of the web application firewall and not, you're not going to let him even try to break your login screen, for instance. Multi-factor authentication is another example of defense in depth. Uh, VPN is also uh, perimeter security, although it's, nowadays it's not considered that great of an idea. But still, it's, it's an additional complexity, it's an additional layer. The next principle, least privilege. And this principle says that you should be really, really stingy and not give, uh, not give privileges away unless they're absolutely necessary. So you should grant the minimum privileges, which means um, if you, it's, easy, it's, it's sometimes easier to, to just say, you know what, I'm gonna give you admin rights and then we don't have to go through this hassle and, and then you tell me, ah, but I cannot do this and you have to give me more privileges. Uh, that, that's exactly what least privilege is. You should never go for the highest privilege because it's easier to do that. Uh, and again, I have some examples. Um, examples from, not from a technical world. Um, if, if your babysitter has the house keys, if you're leaving on a vacation, it's probably a good idea to take the house keys back. Of course, it's, it's a little bit idiotic example, but, clear, but it clearly illustrates, illustrates the point. Um, or if your friend has to check your mailbox uh, well, while you're on a vacation, just give him the keys to the mailbox, don't give him to the keys to the house, because he might end up having a party at your house or whatever. Um, examples from the real, real life password reset hashes, you should keep them uh, to a minimum time, again, to, to make the least possible privilege means if, you're, if you have a password reset hash, ideally it should be valid for 10 minutes or not even that. So as little as possible amount of time. We often hear from customers saying, oh yeah, but two weeks is way too long because the users are not gonna really start their account and use it. You can always introduce a forgot password page and but which will trigger a password reset and send it to the user and it will be valid for 10 minutes and not, not longer than that. A nice example from a real world where things are not done as they should is the Unix system, which actually requires root access for all the ports that are below 1025, which is a, actually it's, like I said, it's a bad thing because eventually if you're running, if you're running send mail, which is a daemon that sends mails, you have to run it on port 25 or typically run on, ran on port 25 and it doesn't really need root access. So, but because the system is designed in that way, you kind of need to run it as root. Yeah, if, if you have people who are part of the QA team on your team uh, and you want to give them access to the tests uh, on the repository, uh, this is based on our actual uh, team. Uh, you, you don't want to give them full access to the, to the full repository you just want to give them access to the test branch, for instance, or at least the right access. They should have only right access to the test branch. Now, again, why, why this is not a slide to tell you why you shouldn't do it, but it's more of a slide to explain why people don't do least privilege. 
First of all, it's not always obvious to figure out what, what least privilege is. It might take some time. And yeah, people are sometimes busy and they just assign maximum privileges because it's easy. And, uh, and, and the one which I really dislike to hear, uh, I didn't hear it for quite some time, to be honest. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because we're recording this one. Uh, so sometimes you have someone who maybe doesn't have yet enough experience, who never heard of this principle because you don't do this course on the onboarding, during the onboarding. They come back to you and say, oh, if, you, if I don't do this as admin, things break, so give me admin rights. Well, you, should, you shouldn't do that. The next principle, fail, safe, fail secure defaults or fail safes. Well, typically safety is, is regarding uh, when, when people's life is in danger and security is about software security. And the, the principle tells you that you should deny access by default. And I will have an, I have, I have a nice example here, um, which is in code. Oh no, wait, the code example is a bit later. So good examples for this are, or are well, good examples where things are not done with fail secure defaults are downgrade attacks on communication protocols. So downgrading HTTPS to HTTP. Uh, in mobile networks, you can also downgrade. Well, in HTTPS to HTTP is something that you should prevent, and we do that. So your SS your SSL configuration should make sure that people cannot downgrade to HTTP. Uh, the same is not true in mobile networks. In mobile networks, you can, you can always downgrade to a, uh, from 4G, you can downgrade to 3G and you can downgrade to Edge. And once you're downgraded to Edge, you can actually uh, eavesdrop on the communication. So you can intercept all messages and calls. And this is why SMS should not be used as multi-factor authentication because it, it, it has a, 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 a weakness. So if, if you know that somebody is resetting his, uh, is somewhere in a bar, you can, you can trick him uh, by resetting his password, triggering an SMS to him, bringing with you a small, you, uh, a small briefcase so you make sure that his mobile is linked to your antenna rather than the official antenna, and your antenna downgrades it to Edge and you can eavesdrop to. It actually works. I haven't done it, but that can definitely work in theory. In theory. Um, yeah, something that in theory you should not allow, and this is related a little bit to the usability. So I said there is one a couple of principles which I'm not going to talk about. One of them is, is usability versus security. And in that, this is a little bit related to that. So users are not really going to read the text that you show them. Which means whenever HTTPS breaks, it's not like you should say, are you sure you want to proceed and say yes, because users are going to do that. You should make sure that users cannot do that at all. And I've seen some browsers which make it very, very complicated. So there is no way on earth my mom can, can figure a way out of it because it's, it's really complicated. I think on MacBook, it even asks you for a pseudo password to make sure that you can skip the HTTP, HTTPS, so you can downgrade. Um, so fail secure principle would uh, require that you simply don't allow downgrading attacks. Um, a little bit related to this is whitelist versus blacklist. So if you want to go to fail secure, you want to target whitelist and fail anything else rather than say, okay, this is the blacklist which I'm going to fail and anything else is considered okay. Another example, very nice one, and it's been, uh, it's been abused quite a while, uh, JSON web tokens. Apparently there is one algorithm which Still nobody knows why it was there. I think it was added for testing purposes. Um, so JSON Web Tokens is, is a small, you, you can, let's call it a string which says, my name is Aram, uh, this is my email address. And at the end, there is a signature that verifies that. And the signature uh, adheres to, is, is generated based on a certain algorithm. So algnon would mean that this signature doesn't have any algorithm. There is no encryption that anybody can generate this signature. As opposed to that, a, a proper algorithm for JSON web tokens, you cannot just generate a, a signature for it. Only the server has the key to do that. And because this was in the, in the tech stack, this was in the specification, many libraries would allow this. And actually there is a website which I put here, which you can use to check when was the last attack, successful attack for this one. Um, and people would simply say, I'm the root user for this website 
and this is my signature and I'm gonna use algnon. And the server would simply accept that because he said, ah, oh, this is algnon and his signature is correct. You should not do that. that, that there sh you should not allow algnon by, the, by design. An example from the code, and I want you to tell me what is wrong here and how it should be rewritten to make it secure or to make it adhere to this principle. So, sh shall I go through the lines or you can you figure that out? Huh? You cannot see? Because I'm on the way? You can't see? So the first line says, uh, I'm gonna check is access allowed, put it in a variable, and the first if, is, if, if this variable is equal to error access denied, I'm gonna throw an exception, otherwise I'm gonna allow this and because you said you cannot see it, you are the one who has to tell me what's wrong here. Maybe the exception should be allowing them in, and by default you should be not allowing them in. Okay, the only person here who cannot code gave, gave, gave the right answer. Yeah, so it should be reversed. Actually, you should check whether you have an explicit access allowed, and then if that's okay, you should allow him, and anything else should be disallowed. So this is a little bit the whitelist, blacklist approach. You should have an explicit state which says this is okay and all the rest I'm going to be saying no, this is not going to go. Um, why people don't do this? Well, sometimes we want to support legacy systems. When HTTPS was introduced or it took quite a while to go for full HTTPS and forget HTTP, in that scenario we would still allow HTTP downgrades and to support that it was still necessary. There is absolutely no explanation to have JSON web tokens, uh, to have algnon, never was. Um, and sometimes it's easier to work with shorter, so blacklists sometimes are shorter than a whitelist. And one example which we had recently was we wanted to allow registration on a web page only if your account is not using a free email account. So if it's an actual corporate account and unfortunately it, it seemed like there are way more corporations out there than there are uh, free email providers. So then there is a blacklist approach that we use there. Okay, the next principle is um, don't try to, to make things more complicated than necessary. You cannot read this? You? Yeah, the big text, yeah. So you don't read the complexity is the enemy of security? Somehow. But you should come closer then. Okay, yeah, well, so the, the, the principle is you should not go complex, uh, you should keep things uh, minimalistic and you should not introduce things which you, you think you might need in the future just out of, out of, just like that. I know it's sometimes a trade-off, sometimes you say, but actually I really, really think we're going to need it tomorrow. There, it, it's a little bit of, depends on the situation, but don't try to introduce things which are obviously too complex and unnecessary. Uh, I have examples. Well, the first example is never, never, ever use encryption or hashing algorithms which you created yourself. Don't do this. Uh, a, a great counter example is apparently there were, they are now figuring out crypto ex, cryptographic algorithms for quantum computers and they made an actual competition for this, so worldwide and four. Uh, it, it was a huge list which eventually got trimmed down to four. And one of these four, which was shortlisted, uh, also got broken recently uh, because the mathematics was not sound. So the cryptographers actually also admitted that they were not so strong in mathematics. So eventually the people who broke it, other cryptographers, figured out a way to mathematically somehow uh, trick the game, I'm going to use that term, I'm not a cryptographer so, and I so don't, I'm not that far in mathematics, my knowledge is basic. So yeah, eventually the, the, the lesson learned is never ever do custom encryption or hashing. And obviously you should also use strong crypto and strong hashing algorithms, uh, the ones that are still considered secure. You should never use exotic authentication scheme for API calls. You should use what's best practice. 
should use uh, authentication using JSON Web Tokens. And yeah, something that falls into the category, I'm gonna overkill it. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, so I often come across these checklists that are asking our, about our security posture of our organization. And often people have put there like, do you encrypt all the data? No, we don't encrypt all the data. Who the hell on earth encrypts all the data on a in a database? I don't know that. I have never heard of such a story. So you're not gonna encrypt the user's name, surname, and email. You're gonna protect it. You're gonna protect it using other approaches, but you're not gonna encrypt this data. Well, maybe unless he's a patient and you're gonna store his patient name, surname, and email. And it's, uh, yeah, it depends on the, on, the on, the, on the risk of the application, but standard, you're not gonna encrypt the whole database. At the very least, because searching in that database is gonna be super, super complication. Um, why we're not doing this sometimes? Well, uh, you might have a new technology and you still haven't figured out what's the best practice there. You might lack the expertise and the experience. Uh, you might want to uh, be compatible with legacy. Uh, so you introduce some complexities. If else, if it's a newer version, use this. So it makes it just a little bit more complicated than necessary. Or you might also desire new features and uh, keep it more complicated than necessary. But you should always try to make it as easy as possible, especially when it comes to security. By the way, this is true for, any, uh, for anything, not only security. This one, I love it. Uh, no secret sauce uh, or security by obscurity. Um, assume, you should always assume that the attacker is gonna find out everything about your system. Um, so it, this is why cryptography, everything is stored in a key. There is no crypto that, not crypto in the sense of cryptographic protocol and encryption protocol, not crypto money. Uh, so all crypto is based on uh, the principle of, everybody knows the algorithm, and I only I have the key and I only have to protect the key. So in, in the past year, in a in very, very long time ago when there were crypto systems which were huge, like a huge uh, room that does the actual encryption, the, there was no way, if the enemy is attacking you, you cannot take all that thing and run away. You just take the key and run away and that's it. Um, think about that analogy every time you're gonna, you wanna try something with security by obscurity. Uh, reverse engineering is easy and uh, things, examples that I've heard is using, a, nobody knows that I'm using this API endpoint that is random, some random string numbers. Nobody's gonna find it out. Don't do that, everybody, they, they can eventually figure it out. And I've also heard even if somebody finds out where my API endpoint is, there's no way they can figure out the parameters. They can always brute force them and figure it out or, or sniff somewhere some sample requests and, 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 and it's done. And we're gonna use GUIDs, which are, it, it's actually not a bad idea to use GUIDs as a protection mechanism against direct object references. So if you're gonna go to my account slash one slash two slash three, where the one, two, three are the user IDs, if you switch that with a GUID, you, you could claim that people, there's no way people can generate a GUID and figure out which is my GUID. But still, that's not enough for protecting uh, your endpoints. You should use uh, proper authorization for that. So you should validate. And GUIDs make it a little bit more complicated to test. So I'm not a huge fan of using GUIDs. It's, it's still a, it's a valid approach, but don't use GUIDs as protection mechanism or as the only way to secure your API endpoint and the direct object reference. Um, one more principle is zero trust. Uh, and this one is used to be, it's also related to direct object reference. It used to be on OWASP top 10 in 2017, number four it was. So apparently it was very common to forget uh, authorization. So user is authenticated, but he should be only able to access account slash one where his ID is one and it was often to forget the authorization checks whether he's allowed to access that account. Uh, yeah, so you should, any time you should check whether the user has proper rights to access a resource. And finally, my last principle I wanna tell you about is accountability. 
and we've been championing in this uh, for quite some time already, you should log effectively and, to, and even if bad things happen, you should be able to reconstruct the situation. So, so at least you should keep in your logs who performed an action, when and what did they access. Uh, this is also handy when users complain and say, yeah, there is a bug here, you have to try to figure out what happened. And it's also handy when the users actually break the system and claim that it wasn't them, that this is suddenly things disappeared. You can use this to, to, make sh to, to have some accountability uh, uh, logs. And of course, you can also check if some legitimate users try to, hack in, to, try to hack in your system and make him accountable for that. Okay, that's it. Um, I'm open to questions. I have uh, one question and one comment, if I may. Sure. When you were talking about uh, cross-site scripting, yeah, that sounded to me much like uh, code injection. What is the difference between the two, or is it the same thing? Um, cross-site scripting is a code injection. Okay. Right. And. Um, I have a comment on, on the reason why people might give too much access. Actually, this happened this morning with the, with the sales team. We, we had to give uh, somebody um, admin access to the WordPress uh, asset to, to make redirects. And then other people sometime in the future will have to make redirects too, which I didn't give them ad admin access at the time because, I, because of the least, uh, the least uh, privilege. privilege principle. But it kind of feels awkward if you don't give people in your team access to something. And there's like a psychological aspect that happens that it kind of feels like you don't trust them or something. And I think in that context, it's very important that you get to frame this well or that the manager who's doing this uh, is, is prepared or trained in, in explaining why I'm not giving you access rather than just, you know, the, the socially easy thing to do is to say, yes, I trust you, I'll give you access. Yeah, that's a good point. Never, never thought about it, actually. Yeah, so, well, I'm going to say it again for the sake of the recording. I'm not sure if it's on the recording. So the point is that when you deny access to full access or you give the list privilege, you should clearly explain why you're doing that and provide perhaps examples. But this is why this training is part of the onboarding where